Welcome to the Synthesis of Yoga podcast series. We are on the 12th episode. A beautiful number. I'm happy we have reached this far. We are on the third chapter of the book and on the fourth paragraph. In the last episode, we touched upon this threefold life like the previous chapter was on three steps of nature and now the same three steps are folded into our life all our activities are affected and influenced by these three folds of life what are they the bodily life the progressive mind and the spirit behind which is yet to evolve and emerge and yet they are mutually interdependent that's what he elaborated in the first three paragraphs of this chapter there is a interdependency on these three and there is also a discord between them because they don't necessarily accept each other and it is necessary for us to find a way to synthesize them so that our progress our evolutionary progression can be made smoothly and divinity can be manifested and before now diving into how that journey is sri arbindo will be diving into each of these folds three folds the bodily life the progressive mind and the spirit so now let's move on with this detailing of these folds in ordinary nature they have each their own characteristic and governing impulse governing impulse the word impulse we can look at it from a human perspective as well as from nature's larger impulsion perspective there's a governing impulse there's a force the way it moves and there is a characteristic governing impulse each one has a unique governing impulse in ordinary nature they have their own characteristic governing impulse the characteristic energy of bodily life is not so much in progress as in persistence not so much in individual self enlargement as in self repetition so persistence and self repetition are through character two characteristic movements of bodily life so the characteristic energy of bodily life is not so much in progress it is not so much concerned about how to progress but persistence it needs its food it needs its sleep it needs its play it needs its mating drives fulfilled that's it and it is through that it will persist persist and it has not much concern with progression from one thing to other the learning journey is not yet there in the bodily life it is about persistence also it is not so much in individual self enlargement as in self repetition so we can see animal life is very much content in its grooves they wake up they sing their songs play eat mate sleep repeat the cycle there isn't anything like let me now enlarge my territory conquer other territories they are pretty much settled with their territories stabilized 
the stability of the ecosystem in which they are also a stable part playing their stable territories and food chain in which they exist. That's characteristic nature of the bodily life. And for human beings too, those who do not have the second step established, this is the first birth, the bodily life. In bodily life, this is the nature. I am satisfied with my circle, a little circle in which I exist. And its instinct is to persist and self-repeat. So let me read there is again, this line again. The characteristic energy of bodily life is not so much in progress as in persistence, not so much in individual self-enlargement as in self-repetition. So it will go on repeating itself endlessly so that it will persist. It has to survive, persist through self-repetition. There is indeed in physical nature a progression from type to type, from vegetable to the animal, from animal to man. For even in inanimate matter, mind is at work. So on a large time scale, if you look at physical material nature, there is a progression. And the reason for this progression, Sri Aurobindo is bringing in, is even in inanimate matter, mind is at work. Mind has the sense of progress and mind is involved and it will push. But these cycles are large cycles. It's over millennia or millions of years. Nature's slow evolution and progress takes place. But if you look at a single life form, once a type is established, here he says, there is indeed in physical nature a progression from type to type. What is type to type? We have science very beautifully sketched out the tree of life, the tree of evolution, where started with single cell life, then they started clustering and became multicellular organisms. And that whole journey in which various life forms emerged. When a particular life form emerges, it becomes a type. And within the type, there can be subtypes. But once a type is established, a dog type, a lion type, or if you take trees, a mango type, a coconut type, once a type is established, there is a repetition, a persistence of the type. There is indeed in physical nature a progression from type to type, from vegetable to the animal. So there is a progression in evolutionary process from vegetable to animal, from animal to man. For even in an inanimate matter, mind is at work. So that evolutionary process unfolding from matter to plants, from plants to animals, from animals to man, there is a clear progression. There is an involved mind pushing, 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 and so that it can emerge. That progression is there. But once a type gets established, whether it is in the matter or in plants or in animals, once it is established, the type will tend to persist and self-repeat. And this gets transferred over to human beings. We become a tribe and its customs, its traditions, the need to preserve and repeat itself again and again and then persist. This comes from that old tendency. So the characteristic energy of bodily life is not so much progress as in persistence, not so much individual self-enlargement as in self-repetition. There is indeed in physical nature a progression from type to type, from vegetable to the animal, from animal to man. For even in inanimate matter, mind is at work. 
But once a type is marked off physically, the chief immediate preoccupation of the terrestrial mother seems to be to keep it in being by a constant repetition. Keep it in being by a constant repetition. Terrestrial mother, mother nature. So on earth there is this incredible evolution unfolding and in which she is gradually, progressively over millions of years manifesting various types. And the way she preserves and conserves a particular type is through repetition. Keep it in being by a constant reproduction. So in nature everywhere we have abundantly visible methods of reproduction. Nature has come up with different ways of reproduction, whether it is sexual reproduction or other forms of reproduction. She has come up with various ways to reproduce a type again and again and again so that it is kept in her being. The terrestrial mother, in her being, the type is held through constant reproduction of its form. Once a type is marked off physically, the chief immediate preoccupation, the chief immediate preoccupation of the terrestrial mother seems to be to keep it in being by a constant reproduction. For life always seeks immortality. But since individual form is impermanent and only the idea of a form is permanent, in the consciousness that creates the universe, for there it does not perish. Such constant reproduction is the only possible material immortality. Remember in the very first paragraph of Synthesis of Yoga where Sri Aurobindo is saying, rebirth is a condition of material immortality. Life is immortal. Here he is saying, life always seeks immortality. There is an instinct in life. It knows that itself is immortal. And life always seeks immortality. There is this beautiful story in Mahabharata where uh, Yudhishthira was asked, what is the most amazing thing in life? And he says, it is this that all human beings who are born have died, but each human being still believes we are immortal, we will not die. There is something in us that fundamentally at a deep level knows that I am deathless. And life always seeks immortality. But since individual form is impermanent, like there is life cycle for a biological form. It is impermanent. For every type of life, every form of life, there is a life span for the body where it, it takes birth, it matures, it lives, and then it ages and dies and disintegrates. And the cycle repeats again and again and again. So the individual form is impermanent. And only the idea of a form is permanent. Now, this is the most important part here. The idea of form. Where is this idea of form permanently existing? We see that our modern science is diving deep into biology, into cellular life and into genetic code and trying to see is that where the idea of form preserved? It's an ongoing research. Where is the idea of form preserved? In yogic perspective, here Sri Aurobindo reveals that only the idea of a form is permanent in the consciousness that creates the universe. 
This is the fundamental difference. The consciousness is fundamental to reality. Existence is conscious. That out of that conscious existence, forms are arising. It is in that consciousness, the idea of form is permanently held. Though individual biological form disintegrates, dies after a lifespan, but the idea of form is held in the consciousness that generates form. It uses the genetic structure for its perpetuation, but it is not in the genetic structure the idea of form is held. It is in the consciousness that creates all life where it is held. This is a fundamental difference between the yogic knowledge system and modern science which is trying to enter into this domain. One is bottom-up, growing through material structures, trying to understand. Other is coming from the pure consciousness perspective, where the vision is this. Life always seeks mortality, but since individual form is impermanent and only the idea of a form is permanent, in the consciousness of in the consciousness that creates the universe, not just life forms, but the universe, for there it does not perish. The idea of form doesn't perish in that consciousness. It is held. Such constant reproduction is the only possible material immortality. So one can reproduce from that idea the material forms. And we can see that in our own creativity. Once we have an idea, once we have a design, we can store the design as a blueprint and take a print out as and when required. It is held as a software memory. It can be printed out and made a material form. So here again, it's a just a metaphor I'm using. In the universe and its terrestrial mother's evolutionary journey, the, all the creative forms are emerging from the consciousness that is behind it. Out of that, this manifestation is arising and there the idea of form is held. And there it is permanent. Idea of form is permanent in the consciousness that creates the universe for there it does not perish. Such constant reproduction is the only possible material immortality. In the current conditions of material life, this is the only possibility. A constant reproduction is the only possible material immortality. Self-preservation, self-repetition, self-multiplication are necessarily then the predominant instincts of all material existence. To the material existence, the bodily life are instinctively driven by these three movements, three instincts, self-preservation, self-repetition, self-multiplication. So there is this tendency to multiply life and repeat the same life so that it can preserve itself. These are fundamental characteristic movement of bodily life. And we carry it, even when we take human birth, our first birth is in bodily life. There these instincts reside. Self-preservation, self-repetition, self-multiplication are necessarily then the predominant instincts of all material existence. Material life seems ever to move in a fixed cycle. Animal life goes in its cycle. It repeats again and again. It reproduces, it multiplies, it repeats itself, it preserves itself. It goes 
in cycle very slow progression over millions of years but in human beings we inherit this bodily life and it has same characteristics self multiplication self repetition self preservation and repeating again and again and again material life seem to seems ever to move in a fixed cycle let's now move on he is now coming to the mind so far what we read was the characteristic impulse instinct of the bodily life the first birth now let's see what is of the second birth the second step the characteristic energy of pure mind is change and the more our mentality acquires elevation and organization the more this law of mind assumes the aspect of con a continual enlargement improvement and better arrangement of its gains and so of a continual passage from a smaller and simpler to a larger and more complex perfection this is mind very different character altogether from life the characteristic energy of pure mind is change it cannot rest in the same circle going round and round and round and round animal life can do that but the awakened mind cannot be going round and round in the same cycle it will be troubled by the questions curiosity to explore and enlarge and expand so the more our mentality acquires elevation and organization elevation there is an ascension into more and more complex knowledge and organization so various fragments of knowledge gets organized into larger and larger body of understanding so there is an elevation and organization the more our mentality acquires elevation and organization the more this law of mind assumes the aspect of a continual enlargement improvement and better arrangement and we can see it everywhere in the modern society even the very sourcing of knowledge the scientific research we see various frontiers acquiring knowledge and organizing this knowledge and identifying this is an area where we still don't have clarity this is what we know this is what we do not know this is what we are currently exploring this is something that we have validated and tested and we know this works this is the right knowledge so there is a continuous enlargement and improvement and better arrangement the whole body of knowledge whether it is scientific knowledge or various other fields of knowledge and expertise and understanding everything gets organized better and better and enlarging the field of study so there is an enlargement improvement and better arrangement of its gains and so of a continual passage from smaller and simpler to a larger and more complex perfection things are moving from smaller to simpler and larger and more complex perfection it's a good time to recall the two movements of nature that intervenes remember the first paragraph of the first chapter where sri aurobindo is referring to how these two necessities of nature's workings intervene into human activities one is this evolutionary movement moving from simple to more and more complex more and more complete perfection so there is this evolutionary progression that is part of nature's instinct and mind embodies that mind has this instinctive need to 
expand, enlarge, and improve and organize things better and better. And mind is involved in nature and in human beings, mind wakes up. So of a continual passage from a smaller and simpler to a larger and more complex perfection. So we try to organize things of a higher and higher levels of perfection and organization. And our societies themselves we see evolving from simple forest dwellers as hunter-gatherers to small kingdoms to then empires to nation states now to a global civilization organizing itself at a global scale 8 billion people more than that organizing themselves into a global civilization and bringing all its knowledge from various pockets of humanity learning from each other synthesizing all that knowledge to making it into a larger, much better, well-organized body of knowledge accessible to entire humanity. And these are the type of work that is right now will become increasingly easy and possible with the help of technologies like artificial intelligence that can process knowledge coming from diverse cultural backdrops, various languages, and get into the essence and find the universal patterns that are common to humanity as a whole. And this progression is rapidly now moving towards larger and larger synthesis. So there is more and more complex perfection towards which things are moving, but it's turbulent because what is not universally true in any particular cultural body of knowledge will be discarded. Only what is true will be taken. What is universal will be taken in the new synthesis. What is locally customized versions, which is applicable only into small context will be discarded. What will be taken forward will be the universal truths. And Sri Aurobindo says, yoga is one such deep truth will be necessary for humanity and that synthesized vast body of knowledge will be of a dynamic element for the future of humanity. That body of knowledge is available in India. That will be of a great value to entire humanity for the evolutionary progression we are about to embark upon or rather we are already in that intense transformative journey. For mind, unlike bodily life, is infinite in its field, elastic in its expansion, easily variable in its formations. This is one of the advantages of mind. Unlike bodily life, our biological body is having very limited flexibility, very limited capacity for expansion, elasticity it has but it has a certain limitation and life working in that therefore gets bound within it but mind can break away from this limitation of bodily life mind need not get bound it can grow infinitely body will grow only to certain height and it will stop it will grow only to certain width it will stop it has a specific form and it will work within that. Life energy also works within certain limits. But the mind is capable of an infinite enlargement. So mind, unlike bodily life, is infinite in its field, elastic in its expansion. Not only expand, it can go into infinite variety of fields infinite in its field, elastic in its expansion, easily variable in its formations. Mind can change its formations. It can structure knowledge in a certain way, but once it discovers a better way of organizing, it can easily dissolve the old formation and enter 
adopt a new formation. That's very easy for the mind when it is on its own. But when the mind is bound by instincts of the life, bodily life, it will not have that courage to open up to new possibilities. But left to itself, mind's instinct and its very nature is this expansion and ability to change things. For mind, unlike bodily life, is infinite in its field, elastic in its expansion, easily variable in its formations. Change. Then, self-enlargement self and self-improvement are its proper instincts. So the mind has this fundamental instinct of self-enlargement, self-improvement. These are two fundamental instincts of the mind and we can see in today's modern world, it's predominantly a mentalized civilization. So at least in the field of technology, we see the next version, improved version and that speed with which we can improve and move on to the next better, more organized, more efficient ways of doing things is so fast. It's a typical expression of the instinct of the mind to self-enlargement and self-improvement. Not just enlarge in terms of scale, but in terms of quality and efficiency, improving the ability, both are mind's typical, fundamental, proper instincts. Mind too moves in cycles, but these are ever enlarging spirals. Its faith is perfectibility. Its watchword is progress. That's mind. Mind has this perfectibility, that's the faith. It's an innate faith in the mind that it can be perfected. The society can be improved. The world situation can be improved. We can have a better life, better technology. Anything and everything can be improved. Progress is its watchword. And even though mind moves in cycles, it's an ever enlarging spiral of progress. That's the difference. Whereas life, get stuck, though it looks like a spiral, uh, spiral, it doesn't, there's a change, but it is repeating again and again and again and again. But the moment mind enters, it pulls out of that and begins to progress. That's the second birth, the awakening of the progressive mind in humanity or an individual. The moment mind wakes up in you, mind becomes self-aware. It can perfect itself. It has the thirst to know and progress and grow. Awakening of the mind, the spirit awakening in the mind is a major step. It's a new birth compared to the animal existence. A human being can exist like an animal without this progressive instinct of the mind being awake. It is when the mind awakens, the soul in the mind awakens, then this need to learn and enlarge and expand and grow and perfect and progress, all that become very natural needs of the mind. The characteristic law of spirit is self-existent perfection and immutable infinity. Now, this is a very different character than the mind. Mind is searching and finding, whereas in spirit, it is self-existent perfection. Spirit is already perfect. There is a self-existent perfection and immutable infinity. It is immutable. It cannot be changed. It is eternal, timeless, immutable infinity. It's so different from the nature of the mind. Mind lives in ignorance, searching for knowledge, enlarging, perfecting all its creative forms, whatsoever it creates, it's incomplete and it is pushing towards greater and greater perfection. That's the very nature of the mind. 
Whereas in the spirit, the whole law is changed. It is self-existent, perfection, an immutable infinity. It possesses always and in its own right the immortality, which is the aim of life and the perfection, which is the goal of mind. So the two preceding steps, the bodily life has its instinct seeking of immortality and aim of this mind is to search and arrive at perfection. Both immortality and perfection are already in the spirit. It is self-existent there. It possesses always in its own right the immortality which is the aim of life and the perfection which is the goal of mind. The attainment of the eternal, the realization of that which is the same in all things and beyond all things, equally blissful in universe and outside it, untouched by the imperfections and limitations of the forms and activities in which it dwells, are the glory of the spiritual life. See, this perspective of the spirit is so fundamentally different. This poise of being is so fundamentally different. Whenever you are in the mind, it has this deep sense of incompletion. It is imperfect and it has to search, find, arrive at perfection. Whereas in the preceding stage of the mind, if in the bodily life, it's conserve and preserve. That's it's, it is through repetition, self-repetition, self-replication, it survives and survives and survives. Whereas in the mind, there is this instinct and search where a spirit is self-existent perfection. The attainment of the eternal and the realization of that which is the same in all things and beyond all things. The realization of that which is the same in all things. This is where the fundamental nature of Sachidananda, the spirit behind all things, that is the fundamental thing that is common, that which is same in all things, that pure consciousness, same in all things and beyond things. Because the spirit is not only in things, but it is also beyond time and space, beyond manifestation. So the attainment of the eternal and the realization of that which is same in all things and beyond all things, equally blissful in universe and outside it. So this spiritual existence is blissful in the universe as well as blissful outside the universe. Untouched by the imperfections and limitations of the forms. It is unstained and untouched by the forms in which it dwells, through which it is trying to express itself in the material world. It is incorruptible. It is untouched by the imperfections and limitations of forms and activities in which it dwells. Forms and activities in which it dwells are the glory of the spiritual life. So it, when you have a third birth into your spiritual self, this is its very nature. It has immortality, perfection, bliss, all that innate in it. There is no need for it to acquire it. There is no need for it to search for it. It can express its delight of being, its perfection through whatsoever means through which it is living and expressing itself. Though the instrument's limits, but the spirit by itself is not bound by those limitations. 
So the attainment of the eternal and the realization of that which is the same in all things and beyond all things, equally blissful in universe and outside it, untouched by the imperfections and limitations of the forms and activities in which it dwells, are the glory of the spiritual life. So here we have these three births, births into bodily life, birth into progressive mind where there is instinct of progress and perfection, then there is birth into the spirit where there is this eternal, timeless bliss, self-existent delight, self-existent perfection, self-existent immortality. These are the three possibilities. So with that, we come to the end of today's episode. See you next time. Please subscribe to the channel. Keep in touch. Enjoy the journey. And please do share your suggestions for improvement. Thank you.